Holy Father, the most important words that will be said now are from your word, the eternal word that you have given us. I pray that you would guide us to understanding. I pray that you would guide us to acceptance, that we would receive the word implanted, which is able to save our very souls. So, Lord, we give to you this time. We pray that you would um, help us to get out of the way. I pray that you would help me to get out of the way and that you would speak. In the wonderful name of Christ, God's people said, amen. Amen. James chapter 3, let's read it again. It's going to be the text for the next couple of messages. Um, Obviously, uh, half of it will not be finished today, uh, even what we, we have here before us, but even over the next little bit. And part of the reason is this. James is dealing with many touchy issues that affect Christians. He's dealing with the issues. In fact, he starts, as we'll see here in just a moment, he starts his letter to um, us through the issue of suffering. And then he deals with sins of the heart, sins of the mind, sins of the tongue. And then he circles back on suffering again in the process of this. If you're new to us this morning, we do a review in um, the context that is here. As you read the Bible, you need to know what the context is. And so this is for all of us to remember, but it's especially, uh, maybe if you're new to us this morning, we want you to really get something out of this. So let's look on the review and the context that is here. This is the first letter written. Write that in there, first. This is the first letter written to the earliest churches of the New Testament. So um, there's, there's all kinds of letters in your New Testament. They were written to individuals and to churches. And, and this letter is the first one we believe that was written. And there's, there's key marks in that all the way through it. But look at number two. The letter of James gives several tests to help you determine if you are a true Christian. You see, Pastor James was concerned that people were going to churches, they were going to synagogues that had become um, Christ-following messianic synagogues. They They had received the Messiah of Christ, apparently, but then he started to see as the first few years went by that many people were not actually living as Christians. They would come together culturally, and they enjoyed coming together culturally, and they would talk, but they still acted like the world. And Pastor James was alarmed as he received reports, perhaps from, um, at that time, the, the, what is today modern-day Greece or Turkey, that's Asia Minor, and even across North Africa, as he would receive, people would come back to Jerusalem and to report to him. He maybe had traveled some as well, but we would certainly think that he was receiving reports of what was going on, and he was alarmed at what he saw in his own church in Jerusalem and what he was seeing in churches around. So he, so he started to say, are you really a Christian? You, you say that you are, but do you live like it? And that's what James is about, in part. Number three, this letter has two primary functions. What I've just mentioned is revealing faulty faith. You can fill that in. Revealing faulty faith or exposing fake Christians. Exposing fake Christians. But also the second bullet point you see there is teaching godly wisdom. In the book of James, we see many deep truths of how to walk with God, what we should do and what we shouldn't do. In fact, the book of James is called the wisdom literature of the New Testament. And so there's, there's why is it? My father-in-law, interestingly enough, how many chapters are in the book of James? There's five chapters. Everybody say five. Put up your hand and just say five. All right, you got that? Five. There's five chapters. My father-in-law, every day of his life, Monday through Friday, reads, on Monday he reads James 1. On Tuesday, he reads James 2. On Wednesday, he reads James 3. On Thursday, he reads James 4, thank you. And on Friday, he reads what? James 5. It's the wisdom literature of the New Testament. He says, you know, I'm a businessman. Life is really tough. Business is tough. Um, Running my accounting firm is hard, and I don't always know what to do. I need a lot of wisdom. And so he just, he he reads other passages of Scripture um, every day, But as a businessman, he says, I need the book of James every day. And he's been doing that for decades. He practically has the whole thing memorized. When we talk about James, we were on vacation a few weeks ago when I brought up a passage in James. He said, that's chapter 4, verse 
verse four, I think, and I was like, verse five, and he goes, okay, verse five, and I thought, well, give the guy credit, you know, I mean, he, he practically knows where it is. God's word is so rich, and it helps us deal with the way of life for true Christians. Look at number four. Pastor James now circles back on the true Christian's response, fill it in, to suffering. Now, if you have your Bible, go ahead and look with me at the book of James and open to it. Um, It's right there, right behind Hebrews, um, so it's back in the back end of your New Testament that is there. But I want you to look in James and go to James chapter 1. In James chapter 1 and verse 1, we see the greeting. We see the beginning of the letter. His name shows up so you know who's writing it. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the 12 tribes in the dispersion. That means people that have been spread around the Mediterranean world. So he's, he's writing to Jewish Christians that are spread all over the place who have received Christ. And he says to them at the end of verse 1, greetings. Now, look where he begins this first letter to God's people in the New Testament era. Look where he begins. Look at the subject that he begins with. Verse 2, he says, Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet, what? Trials of what? Various kinds. So the very first thing that he says is this counterintuitive statement dealing with trouble. This doesn't make sense to us. Why would I consider it joyful? Oh, great, I got in a car wreck today and totaled my car. I mean, that sounds like Christian insane people. Wacky Christians that would say that. I mean, that doesn't make logical sense. he's, He's saying, I'm not talking about being trite. He didn't say be happy about it. There's a difference in joy and happiness. Look what he says here in verse 2. Consider it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. And why? Verse 3. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. Verse 5, and let stead, or verse 4, and let steadfastness have its full effect so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Now, James begins with this issue of suffering. Skip down to verse 12 and 15. We see it again. He circles back on it. So it's chapter 1, verse 12. Look at that with me. Blessed is the man who remains what? Steadfast under trial. For when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who, what? Love him. Let no one say when he is tempted, or tested is the idea. No one, let no one say when he is tempted, I'm being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. Verse 14, but each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Verse 15, then desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin, and when sin is fully grown, brings forth what? Death. You see, friends, we live in a fallen world, and we live in fallen flesh that is prone to sin. We, as the great hymn writer says, prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to do what? To leave the God I love. Here's my heart, O take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. So we we live in a setting where we're not only tempted to do the wrong thing, but we're tempted, as verse 13 says, to blame it on God. And it has to do not only with our active sins and rebellions against God, but it also has to do sometimes with troubles and trials that we go through that are no issue and no fault of our own sin. We perhaps have been doing the right thing, and yet trouble comes. And so when all of these things occur, we need to be able to work through 
what is really going on. And then we come to, uh, you see under number four there, I've, I've listed it out. It was chapter one, verse two through four, and then 12 through 15, and then we skip over to chapter five, where we are this morning, 10 through 11. We, we, we see this again. Um, look with me, just skip over there to chapter five. When Pastor Ben was preaching, he, he touched on this. Chapter five, verses 10 through 11, we see it again. The issue of suffering comes up. Look what he says in verse, chapter 5, verse 10. As an example of suffering and patience, brothers, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. Behold, we consider those who remain steadfast. You have heard of the steadfastness of who? Of Job in the Old Testament. And you have seen the purpose of the Lord, how the Lord is compassionate and merciful. And so James brings up like the key poster child of suffering from the Old Testament whose name was what? Job. And we see that, that we live in a fallen world that is rebelled against God and sin. It is entered into the equation and there, there is a great adversary that loves to test God's people and he loves to hurt God's people, and God even says, let me show you my servant Job. And Job goes into tremendous trouble, 42 chapters of trouble. 42 chapters of trouble. And in verse 5, he comes all the way to the end of it all, and he says, I, I heard of the Lord before, but now I've seen him. In the midst of all of it, did, was it all of the blessings that he saw God in? No, it was through the trouble, it was through the testing, it was through the proving of his faith that he would come to say, I now see you. This is counterintuitive. This, this doesn't make sense very often to our human minds that trouble is good. And that God knows and is working through trouble. So I spent some time just really working on this. And I want to take just a few minutes and look at point number five. And then we'll be finished. Don't miss this point number five. This has not to do with review so much as it has to do with context. And it's going to help us in the days ahead. Look at number five. We must recognize the reality of suffering in a fallen world. Now, you would say, well, anybody who doesn't recognize that is a fool. You would say, all you have to do is turn on the television and see the news, pick up the newspaper, click on the news sites. All you have to do is walk outside and see the issues and the troubles. This last week, there was a horrible car accident right here in front of the church where four or five people were critically injured. Alex had to go and peel people out of cars as they were taken to the hospital one after another. I mean, it's, it's right here on our doorstep that there's, there's struggle and pain and suffering. But somehow, in the modern world in which we live, we love to deny obvious realities. We often act as if things, and we live as if things are happening. I mean, we, we go through life without critically evaluating and looking and recognizing some of the most basic issues. And one of the ones that Christians would do well to stop wishing away or to stop ignoring or stop offering trite ideas and perspectives is the reality that suffering is part of God's work and God's plan in our lives of redeeming us out of the fallen world in which we live and the fallen state in which he, did, he lives, excuse me, we live. And most importantly in this, he does not excuse himself from that, but he becomes the first person sufferer. 
as the one who should not suffer anything, the creator of the universe, perfect in all of his ways, he comes and being the perfect God-man, gives his life on the cross for people who had rejected him. This is the gospel. That God comes and does what we could not do. That he comes and he gives his life, and he does it. And in fact, Jesus while we call him the Prince of Peace, the second person of the Trinity, the Son of God, the Lord of Lords, and the King of Kings, he is also called the Suffering Servant. Now that is, that is amazing. And, and I can guarantee you that maybe if this is the, the first time you've come to church, you've not ever heard that out there. You, you, the world doesn't recognize Jesus as the Suffering Servant. The one who would come to die a cruel and unjust, unjust death for our place. Notice this first bullet point underneath the number five is, the issue of pain and suffering is often a tremendous stumbling block both for non-Christians and for Christians. The issue of pain and suffering is a stumbling block very often both for non-Christians and for Christians. A non-Christian can look at the Christian claim and, look at, and say, what do you mean there's a God in heaven that's in charge of all things? Look at the world. Are you crazy? If he is there, he's asleep or he's removed from us. He couldn't possibly still be involved. Well, I understand that's a very popular idea, but if you will take time to see what his word says... And if you will take time to think and listen and walk with him, you will begin to see that God is working very beautifully, very sovereignly through all of the melees of our sin and our foolishness and our suffering. And he is bringing out of that glory to himself. And only God can do that. When Joseph's brothers betrayed him and sold him into slavery, and then he is the king of Egypt, basically. He's the prime minister of Egypt, and they all stand before him, and they realize, wow, this is the brother we sold into slavery, and they're standing before him, and they said, oh, no, he, he's going to kill us. And he said, calm your hearts, brothers. What you did, you meant for evil. Satan has meant this for evil, but God has used it for good. And God had a plan to save their family through things that you would have never seen in Joseph's life as something that would be good. To be persecuted by his brothers, thrown down, left for dead in a well, pulled up, sold off into a caravan, headed to some unknown country. And then Joseph winds up in Potiphar's house, falsely accused, winds up for years in prison. And God had a plan all through the thing. I mean, think about if that was you. God had a plan. We, we, we need to see that it's often a stumbling block, but God has a tremendous plan. Christians very often still struggle with this. We, we often hear popular theology on television, or we hear popular theology from even whether it's Christian programming or secular programming that invades our thoughts more than the truths of God's word. And, and that's when we come to say, that can't be true. That can't be when we read in God's word and we say, what do you mean? How in the world does God take good out of something so evil and so bad? And what we need to do is we need to stop and look and carefully study and see what he is doing behind the scenes in ways that we may not understand. And that leads me to the next part that is here. Strong, mature Christians typically have a solid, fill it in, theology of suffering. You see, theology means the study of God. It has to do with learning about God. It has to do with knowledge of God and how he works. And if you're going to see a mature, solid Christian, I don't mean somebody who's just been a Christian for a long time. There's people who have been Christians for a long time that are still in the high chair. They, they can't even ingest a meaty message 
and accept it and receive it because they, they're, they're still infantile in their thinking and in their heart. I know, I know some older Christians that are, that are the most godly people that you could just you can imagine, and they have used all of those years to walk faithfully, humbly, listening to God, learning His ways, finding out what His Word says, improving Him, and trusting in Him. And then I've met some that that their faith is very shallow, and yet they have been here or in another church for many years. And sometimes we we meet young Christians who have already begun growing very quickly. In fact, when Marcy and I lived in North Africa, we we met Christians that had not grown up in a Christian context, had not grown up in a country that accepts Christianity. In fact, had grown up in a country that rejects Christianity. And and in a very short amount of time, as they they came to faith and they began to read the Bible and they began to trust the Lord, we, we saw them grow as giants because they didn't reject suffering in these issues, but they would just read the Bible, see what it says, and go, oh, God is working good in all of this. I know my family beats me about two or three times a week because I've become a Christian, but God knows what he's doing, and I will trust him. We, Cheryl Anna and I were talking yesterday about a little guy, you've heard me mention him several times, Majid. But there's Majid, and there's Adal, and there's Mafida, and there's, there's a guy named Ramadan. And, and these guys are giants in faith, and they don't know one-tenth the Bible that most of you know. And yet they walk with God through suffering, with joy, because they've read enough and just applied it. So a strong theology of suffering is important for maturity as Christians. Look at the third bullet point. Our fall into sin resulted in separation, suffering, and death. We cannot overlook the importance of this. And this really plays into that theology of suffering we're talking about. One of the things that Christians need to see and understand is the horrific nature of sinning against God. That when all of the human race, through one man's sin, as we see in multiple places, it says, through one man, all have sinned. We fell into sin. You say, well, I wasn't there that day. Well, in some ways you were. Because you are part of the human race. And when the human race said no to God, said, we know better, we come into the vortex of sin. And we come into the suffering that it would bring and the separation that it would bring. In Isaiah 59, it says, your sins and your iniquities have cut you off from God. See, it was the sins and the iniquities that did that. You, you read Genesis 3, that's the fall, that's the story of the fall. And, and in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 21 and 22, we see that through Adam one has sinned and through Christ we can be saved, but it all begins with this issue of falling into sin. And then Romans six twenty three, it says, for the wages of that sin or the consequence of that sin is ultimately what? death. So it's not only pain and suffering, but it's ultimately death. Some would say, well, I thought that death is just a natural process. Didn't God design death as part of the natural process of creation? And I want to be very careful to say to you, no. No. There there was this beautiful picture of life that God designed everything for life. And in the process of it all, when the, when the creation is tainted with sin, then death enters the picture. In fact, do you know the first, the first reference, the first indicator of any death in all of creation? We find it in Genesis chapter 3. 
the first reference to death in the creation is after Adam and Eve sinned against God, fell into the guilt of their sin. They had been naked, everything was fine, but they went and they hid themselves. All of a sudden, their hearts were darkened with sin, and God said, who told you you were naked? And there in the midst of it all, we see the serpent is cursed, the woman is cursed, and then Adam, representing all of the human race, is cursed. And then it says that God went and he covered them with what? They had covered themselves with leaves. He went and covered them with what? with skins. Now, I don't really know of any th- animal that can survive being skinned and still live. You completely skin an animal and it's representing death. The first picture of a, of a living being dying is the skins that God would cover Adam and Eve. This is just the first hint that a sacrifice is being made. That there is death that brings about a covering. The ultimate death that would bring about complete covering of our sin is the Lord Jesus Christ. That he has covered us with his righteousness. That he would give his life thousands of years later after Adam and Eve representing God's covering, his forgiveness of our sins. And so separation, suffering, and death are something that we must come to terms with. Look at the next part that is here, and this is the the last point that is here, and I want you to see it very carefully. In this fallen state, God sovereignly uses pain and suffering to first, to bring us to himself. There are many people in this room that have come to faith in Christ because of difficulty, because of pain and suffering. But really the thing that brings us to God is the pain and suffering of our Lord Jesus Christ. The wrongful execution of Christ in our place, the vicarious, which means he is the vicar, he is the one in between us, he's the go-between priest. Jesus on the cross is between us and God. He is the one that's taking the condemnation of our sin, the vicarious, substitutionary atonement, the substitution, he dies in our place. And the atonement is the satisfaction. So when we talk about the vicarious substitutionary atonement of Christ, we're saying that he is the go-between that, that comes and dies in our place to satisfy the wrath of God. And so this is what brings us to God. And not only does it bring us to God, but it grows us in him. Very often, you're going to grow because of suffering and difficulty. I remember um, when I was a kid growing up that one of my sister's friends, my sister's a little bit older than I am, Andrew's mom, and one of, one of her best friends um, from growing up here at Sheridan Hills was named Jan Sippel. And Jan grew up, came out of Sheridan Hills, went off to college, and she went to forestry, uh, went into forestry. And our families were close, and so sometimes we'd go on vacation together. And she had studied forestry for a while, and then she became a forester. And eventually, she went with the Peace Corps to Africa, planting trees in arid countries that were, that were just, had completely def- depleted their forestry. So she was leading programs to do that. We were on vacation one time in North Carolina, and we were talking about a tree that was there that wasn't growing on our friend's property that was there. He said, yeah, I understand. I planted that tree, and that tree's just kind of been sitting there. It grew up to about six or seven feet, and now it won't grow anymore. And it's just slowed down. The others took off, and they're growing. And, and I just remember Jan saying, hmm, 
And she gets up off the porch. She has a big newspaper. We had a newspaper. This is back in the days, kids, when they used to print news on paper and ink, and you would read, you would read the news, actually. It would be printed. Somebody would actually deliver it to your house. It was kind of amazing. It's called newspaper. Anyways, um, <laughs> we... we um, she had a newspaper, and she, she took that newspaper, and she goes over there to the tree, and she starts just beating the tree all over the, all over the tree. She's running it up and down on the tree. She's, you know, she doesn't get sap on her hands, and she's just doing it. And then she takes hold of the tree, and she pulls on it as hard as she can, and she just starts yanking on it, and she's pulling it over. And I just remember thinking, this woman has gone nuts. She went back up on the porch, and we're all sitting there kind of going. She said, it'll probably start growing now. And she explained. There's a lot of trees, depending on the circumstance, they can kind of get stuck a little bit. And they, they, they kind of, they're not taking the nutrients in. The processes aren't working the way they're supposed to work. So they kind of get stuck. And if you just stress them, if you move the fibers around on them, you kind of break up some of the linkages that are there that it has to regrow some new ones. She, she just explained, well, that, that, that can redeem a tree and put it back on a, on a route to growth. We see that principle throughout creation. And we certainly see it throughout the Bible. That God very often brings growth into our lives through things that we don't understand. And through things that sometimes hurt and they're hard. So he can grow us through this. But there's a third thing that he often does through pain and suffering. We see in the Bible that God keeps us. He keeps us to be his. He holds us to be his very often through pain and through suffering. And even as we come to death, he keeps us. Now, don't, don't please, don't, there's too many important things that are here. You need to see some things. Don't fold anything away. You're going to want to make some notes. And I want you to see, first of all, an area in the, in the Psalms, Psalm 119, that has meant an enormous amount to me. Psalm 119 is the longest chapter in the Bible, and it has become one of my favorite chapters in the Bible. This summer, I've spent a lot of time in Psalms, but several years ago, and in fact, it was even before Marcy's heart attack, when we were when we were fresh on the mission field and there were just a lot of things that were hard, moving our family there and not knowing how to live internationally and, and there was just a lot of stresses and I remember it just being hard. And it was driving us to seek the Lord and I read the beauty of these few verses that I want to share with you this morning and I started going, does he really do that? Look with me in Psalm 119 verse 50 and this is on this on the screen in front of you. Look what he says in verse 50, and these kind of progressively move in intensity. But in verse 50, it says, this is my comfort in my what? Affliction, that your promise gives me life. So I'm going to go through affliction. God knows it. This shows me that he sees me, and he knows it, but it's your promises that get me through the affliction. Look at verse 67. Before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now I keep your word. Wow. Before I was afflicted, before this cancer, or before this leukemia, or before this car wreck, or before this losing my company, or before this other thing that was here, before all this went south, I, I would not stay with you, I would wander away, but before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now I keep your word. Hmm. Verse 71. It is good for me that I was afflicted, that I might learn your statutes, that I might learn your ways, your laws, that I might learn the way you work. And here, the psalmist is gone now, to just saying, well, I'm comforted in my affliction, that, and it even keeps me now from straying away. But now the psalmist says, it's good for me that I was afflicted, that I might learn your statutes, because your statutes are more important than me not being afflicted. 
And then this big one, verse 75, and I've added 76. But look at verse 75. I know, O Lord, that your rules are righteousness and that in faithfulness you have afflicted me. Let your steadfast love comfort me according to your promise to your servant. Oh, may God give us the grace to just trust him in the affliction of our lives. May we so run to who he is and so remember what his word has said that we would say in faith, Lord, I trust that even in the midst of this horror of my heart that I am learning to trust you because you deliver on your promises. 75, I know, O oh Lord, that your rules are righteous and that, you're faithful, that in faithfulness you have afflicted me. Let your steadfast love comfort me according to your promise to your servant. See, in Hebrews 11 it says, without faith it is impossible to please God. And you know what? Our struggles and our pain and our disappointments and our hurts give us more opportunity to trust the Lord than all of our blessings. And if faith is what pleases God more than anything else, may we embrace even the things that we don't understand to say, Lord, the things that I do understand, that you are good and that you are righteous. I I can share with you that Psalm 32, the song of Moses, Um, has helped me through many, 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 many things that I don't understand and that I do not like and that I even sometimes I would be tempted to feel defrauded by God. Psalm 32 says, Ascribe greatness to our God the rock whose work is perfect and all his ways are just. A God of faithfulness, listen, and without injustice, good and upright is he. Amidst the pain and the difficulties of life, we must come to see that his word is true and his word tells us that he is good. And sometimes when you don't know what to do with his hand, you just need to trust his heart. That is what his children are to do. Notice with me 2 Corinthians chapter 12, um, and this will be on the screen in front of you. I mean, is there any more clear example? I mean, who is like one of the greatest Christians that's ever lived on the planet? Who would that be? Uh, I think most of us would say, well, the Apostle Paul. I mean, he's the guy who wrote half the New Testament. Um, Christianity took off. Is God using him? God revealed things to him. God inspired him. God spoke to him. God, and he wasn't even one of the disciples. And yet God said, let me show you what I can do. And you remember with me, before he was Paul, what was his name? Saul. Saul. And what was he doing? Persecuting the body of Christ. Persecuting the people for whom Jesus died. And he, I mean, he was filled with himself. He was brilliant. He was powerful. He had Roman citizenship. He was also just, I mean, he was... He was trained to the hilt to lead the nation of Israel, could someday probably be um, the high priest, depending on how he navigated things politically. But here God gets a hold of him and changes his heart and his mind and begins to use him in powerful ways, eternal ways, beyond the kingdoms of man to the kingdom of God. And look with me on the screen, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, in verse 7 through 10, it says, so to keep me, this is Paul writing to the Corinthians, and he writes to them, so to keep me from becoming conceited because of the surpassing greatness of the revelation, so God was revealing great things to him. A thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of what? Of Satan, to harass me, to keep me from becoming conceited. 
Three times I pleaded with the Lord about this that it should leave me. You say, well, why didn't he pray every day about it? Well, listen, you have to understand the Jewish mindset. In, in Jewish mind, three is part of the idea of completion. Um, seven is, is, is an ultimate completion number, but three is, is, a, is a very, very huge sign of completion. When you do something once, it's one thing. When you do it twice, it's like, okay, you really made it. When you do it three times and you've set it out, you, you've really laid it out before there. I mean, this is part of the, where we get, we believe, the, the idea of holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. You see holy, holy, holy repeated three times. You see several things like this. Well, here is part of it. He's saying, I really asked that God would deliver me from this in verse 8. But look what he says in verse 9. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in what? In weakness. Therefore, Paul says, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Verse 10, for the sake of Christ then, I am content with weaknesses, and he gives us a list. I'm content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Again, counterintuitive. Humans say it a different way. Um, I want to end with some very powerful quotes, and I want you to see these. The first one is from William S. Plummer, an American theologian and pastor from the Northeast. Look at those lamb chops. I mean, is that, I wish I lived in the mid-1800s. I would have loved it. Marcy won't let me, but even check out this one. I mean, isn't that cool? Style changed a little bit, and Pastor Plummer, you know, whatever. So look at this. Here's his book on Psalms. See that? Psalms. Here's his commentary on Psalms. And he would have commented, or he commented on some one, Psalm, Psalm 119, these verses that I mentioned, but also others. But this is Pastor Plummer. I I want you to see and I want you to hear this quote from him because it is so rich and so beautiful. Look what he says. You, O Lord, in faithfulness have afflicted me. When a father disowns and banishes a child, he corrects him no more. So, okay, when the father has had enough, and he says, you've pushed me too far. You, you're, you, there's no more that I can say to you. And there are some cases here on the earth, some of you, that's, that's happened to you, or perhaps you've, you've, you've done this with your child. When, when this happens in humanity, a father is not correcting their son anymore. So God, look what he says, so God may let one whom he intends to destroy go unchastened. So if God, is not go- if God is not going to save you, he's not going to correct you. But never one with whom he is in covenant relationship. You see, if you have a covenant relationship with God, if you are his child, he is going to correct you. He is go- Whom the Lord loves, he corrects. So when you feel God correcting you, don't start wondering what's wrong with God. You may need to say, what's wrong with me? Lord, what do you want? Make me more like you. Help me to see where I'm wrong. And listen to him. So William Plummer understands that very well, that this is the play out of whom the Lord loves, he chastens. How about mathematician Isaac Barrow from England? This guy lived from 1830 to, or excuse me, 1630 to 1677. Um, One of the brilliant mathematicians, some of you would love this guy because he worked in infinitesimal calculus. He developed infinitesimal calculus. Others of you would hate him for that. But he was a Christian brother And he was a theologian first. He was first trained and got his doctorate of divinity 
um, from Oxford, and he was a student of Scripture but he was also a brilliant scientist. And look at the next phrase, phase that is here. This is the opening of one of his books. This is actually a photocopy of one of his mathematician books, his lectures on calculus. Um, so a, a, a brilliant man of God um, worked on the fundamental theorem of calculus. But listen to what he would say. And I know it, the words are small, but it, just listen and carefully follow, and I think you'll be blessed. In all, the advantages rising from afflictions are so many and so great. The advantages arising from afflictions are so many and so great that it is easy to demonstrate that we have great reason not only to be contented with, but to rejoice in and to be very thankful for all the crosses and vexations that come our way. The difficulties, the hardships, the things that you, vexations, the things you don't understand that come our way. To receive them cheerfully at God's hand as the medicines of our soul and the spices of our life, as the arguments of his goodwill and the instruments of virtue, as solid grounds of hope and comforting signs of future joy. For us. You see, we're, we're down in here, summertime, deep into some of the deeper issues of Christianity as we look at what James is going after. That we come to see that he's good. I want to close with a poem. I want to close with a poem that was written by a guy named John Henry Newman. In 1829, he wrote a poem entitled Thanksgiving. He was Anglican. He was an Anglican priest, so it's not talking about American Thanksgiving like our holiday. This is before that, um, before that was even declared. Um, but in 1829, listen to these verses that come from his poem called Thanksgiving. Yet, Lord, in memory's fondest place, I enshrine those, sad, those seasons sad. When looking up, I saw thy face in kind austereness clad. I would not miss one sigh or tear, heart pang or throbbing blow. He said, I wouldn't trade any of them. I wouldn't, I wouldn't miss one sigh or tear, heart pang or throbbing brow. Sweet was the chastisement severe, and sweet its memory now. Yes, let the fragrant scars abide, love tokens in thy stead, faint shadows of the spear-pierced side and thorn-encompassed head. He's saying, my trials are reminding me of what you went through. The last part. And such thy tender force be still when self would swerve or sway, shaping to truth the froward will along thy narrow way. You're keeping me along your narrow way through the difficulty.